starting with uh, three, four, if you count me, uh, native New Orleanians, which is kind of unusual, I think. Uh, we're, we're writers who uh, were born here and uh, for one reason or another are still here. God knows why, exactly. And uh, let me get to that in a minute. I wanted to uh, toss out, I, I know some of you are uh, approaching this sort of as students, and there are a couple of uh, websites, if you haven't found them, that, that address this topic. I wanted to just mention a couple of them. Uh, one is called CARES, uh, Katrina Arts Relief and Emergency Support, and uh, I read through this a few days ago. It's really a wonderful collection of uh, writers responding immediately to uh, to what happened with Katrina and what their immediate plans were. I know John uh, had, a, had a really sort of a very heartfelt brief message basically saying, I'm coming back. And uh, I don't know if Chris and Jason are in that. But anyway, there are, there are dozens and dozens of writers who, uh, who uh, chose to, to post messages there, and it's really worth looking at. K-A-R-E-S. Uh, there's an ongoing publication called NOLA Fugees, uh, the editors of which are somewhere else in this festival in the next few days uh, that does a really excellent job. Uh, the National uh, Book Critics Circle, did I say that right? Um, maintains a website, uh, and in that website is a series called Thinking About New Orleans, and the six or seven writers, Andre Kodrescu, Joshua Clark, um, Tom Piazza, Julie Smith, uh, among them Blake Bailey. Uh, have all posted uh, interviews about their sense of being writers in New Orleans and from New Orleans, uh, which I think are, you know, you might enjoy looking at. Uh, the book editor for the Times Picayune, Susan Larson, wrote the definitive book, Book Lover's Guide to New Orleans, which you all should be aware of if you're not. Um, there's the LSU book, Literary New Orleans, uh, a collection of essays, which is also going to tell you a lot about New Orleans as a hometown. Um, for writers, uh, and I, before I introduce the panel more formally, uh, I, I, this is a subject I think about a lot because uh, in, in, in some ways it's wonderful to be here, in some ways it's very difficult to be here. Andre Kodrescu in his, uh, one of the interviews I read said, uh, you know, post-Katrina, New Orleans is an exhilarating place, but it's hard to write when you're depressed. So that kind of sums up the, uh, I think, a lot of the dichotomy of, uh, of our position. Um, a Wall Street Journal writer, Steve Garbarino, who I gather is a young man, uh, wrote in the Wall Street Journal, uh, came to New Orleans and lived for a while and had some advice for people who might consider making New Orleans their home. He said, uh, at best, now this is kind of, none of us fall into this category. Uh, you can see we're all sober, serious, uh, intelligent, uh, middle-aged people. Um, with, uh, <laughs> well, I knew eventually I'd create a problem there, but, um, and, and I'm not speaking to myself, actually, when I say that. But anyway, um, this is his advice to people who might consider coming to New Orleans to be writers. He says, at best, if you stick around, you will become one of them, uh, an unofficial mayor of a local watering hole, yammering tales instead of writing them down, a character in your own rewrite. That's a sort of cautionary thought about uh, coming to New Orleans to be a writer. And, uh, okay. My, my colleagues here, my friends, you know, I, I was thinking about this. I, I've known each of these people. I know this is not terribly interesting to you all, but it is to me. Uh, so, uh, for 40 years, uh, Jason, uh, more than 40 years. Not that old. <laughs> uh, Jason also writes not, fiction. You unbelievably. <laughs> unbelievably, these people are that old. Uh, but Jason is much younger than me. He was a year behind me in high school. Uh, <laughs> in those days, we called him uh, Jake. That's uh, you know, I just thought I'd say that because I haven't heard anybody call him Jake in three decades or maybe four. Why did we start calling him Jake? Anyway, yes, pretty sporty, Jake. Um, and uh, John, I've known since we were at Loyola together, and uh, we sealed and cemented our friendship. I think one day on a on a 14-hour drive to Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we were both going to become graduate students, uh, and we were pulled over on the side of the road in Scott County, Arkansas, and uh, arrested for transporting liquor through a dry county. <laughs> and uh, all we were doing, we had in our trunk uh, a bottle of wild turkey that we were bringing to Leon Stokesbury, Sam Gwynn, and Jim Whitehead, 
because we thought it would make them like us better. And <laughs> anyway, uh, so when you go through something like that with somebody, you, you remain a uh, friend. And uh, Chris Wilkes, I keep imagining, was there in places that she wasn't. Uh, there was a, a, an extraordinary uh, opportunity at Loyola when we were undergraduates. She was an undergraduate there briefly with me before she moved to San Francisco during the summer of love or one of those things. Summer, summer before love, uh, summer after. Um, Walker Percy taught a seminar for eight or nine people. And when I remember that seminar, I always remember Chris sitting next to me, but she wasn't in it. So just, uh, in spirit. And I have many memories like that, none of which I'll go into. Um, Chris Wills is a novelist, primarily, although, uh, like everyone else at this panel, a writer who writes in multiple genres and, and does an extraordinary job in all of them. She began as a writer of uh, noir fiction, essentially, and has three books, The Emerald Lizard, A Diamond Before You Die, and The Killing Circle, all uh, starring, featuring the same um, Irish Channel uh, detective, uh, Neil Rafferty. And I'm kind of hoping he'll come back as a middle-aged man with uh, you know, all the usual problems if, instead of just a young man uh, detective. But anyway, is he coming back? I think he's dead. Dead. <laughs> Chris told me she's, she's currently working on four novels, and I was hoping one of those was the next Neil Rafferty, but we'll talk. Um, she's also uh, published a, uh, a novel uh, called The Glass House, essentially about uh, New Orleans and uh, race relations in New Orleans. Um, she, uh, she's published uh, an extremely uh, uh, widely read and successful nonfiction account called The Last Madam, uh, which is the account of Norma, uh, who is Norma? Wallace. Wallace, yes. Uh, sort of one of the last uh, high, high rolling uh, great uh, madams of, of New Orleans, uh, which was which won a number of awards, including the Gulf South Booksellers Association Best Book of the Year Award, and uh, was turned into a play uh, performed at Southern Rep, uh, where John Bignet has, Bignet has also has had and currently has plays running. Um, she wrote and produced a documentary about David Duke and David Duke's followers called Backlash, Race and the American Dream. So she's also done work in uh, the genre of film and uh, all around an uh, extraordinarily accomplished uh, writer. Jason Barry is uh, mostly known uh, here and, and abroad internationally as a, an investigative journalist, uh, a really serious reporter with a very wide range of subjects. Uh, his first book was uh, I think it was your first book, 1973, he was, he was quite young, Amazing Grace uh, with Charles Evers in Mississippi, which pretty much tells you the story of what that book was about. I think Charles Evers was running for governor, yeah. and uh, this is, of course, the brother of the, the slain civil rights leader, Medgar Evers. Um, Jason's also uh, co-authored a book called Up from the Cradle of Jazz with two other uh, writers, including the late Tad Jones, uh, an extraordinary look at the Musical History of the City of New Orleans, uh, a book called The Spirit of Black Hawk, uh, a, uh, uh, um, uh, Lead Us Not to Temptation, uh, 1992 book about uh, the Catholic Church and uh, sex abuse of minors, and uh, Vows of Silence, a much more recent book, uh, Abuse of Power in the Papacy of John Paul II. Uh, and that is a, a book out of which he is currently working on a film, uh, which I guess maybe he'll tell us about as, as we get underway. Um, he's also written a, uh, a novel uh, called Last of the Red Hot Papas, which is a, a, a Louisiana a political novel about a demagogic governor. I can't imagine where he got such an idea. Uh, you know, the imagination of the writer is uh, bottomless. And uh, before that, he wrote uh, a story I don't know if it was, I'm, I'll have to ask now, I guess, I'm not sure, but uh, it became a play called Earl Long in Purgatory, which is, uh, uh, again, a, a wonderful uh, evocation of Louisiana politics and, uh, and the sort of madness uh, implied therein, and 
that ran, where, where was that, I'm sorry? Uh, Southern Rep. Southern Rep, so we have three Southern Rep uh, playwrights here as well as everything else they are. Um, Jason started a magazine when he was a student at Georgetown called Generations, and he published a poem of mine called, this is 1970, uh, On the Photographs of Me Lai, just a side note. Uh, yeah. It's not the best poem I've ever written, but it was uh, some serious. Thank you. He's won a Guggenheim Award uh, for uh, research into, uh, into jazz funerals, and he's currently at work on a book on funerals in New Orleans, which is, uh, should, should be a, a page turner. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, it sounds grim, but I have a feeling it's going to be a pretty entertaining book. Uh, he won a, an extremely difficult to get, I know, because I applied for one and didn't. Uh, Alicia Patterson Foundation Award. Uh, in 1992 for reporting on demagogues. And uh, again, uh, you know, all three of these writers have careers that uh, only seem to get broader and, uh, and deeper and uh, more energized uh, as, they, as they go on. And I think that's, you know, I don't know if that says anything about New Orleans and that there's nothing to do here but write or, or if, I mean, once, you know, you've finished drinking. Or, you know. um, Brings us to John Big Viganet, who does not drink, I think, probably. I only drink alone. Only alone. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, there is no record of it. <laughs> uh, he is the Robert Hunter Distinguished Professor of English at Loyola University, where he's taught for uh, many years and where, for a number of those years, he edited uh, New Orleans Review. Uh, for many years, he was the uh, president of the uh, you know, I'm not sure of the actual title, but the Translators Association, Literary Translators Association, uh, to which all, pretty much all uh, literary translators in, I think, the world belong. Uh, Just American. Mostly American, okay, American. And, uh, and out of that interest and experience, published uh, two books, The Craft of Translation and Theories of Translation. The purpose of this panel is to talk about New Orleans as a home for writers. There are a lot of writers who have come here Tennessee Williams, obviously, and uh, and then there are writers like the four of us who pretty much have been here all of our lives, except for uh, I suppose uh, time away in school. Uh, I may be missing a, a year or two here or there in some of your biographies, but I'm, I'm not even sure of that. So my question is, and and we'll go from here. Um, what is it about living here that enhances your work as a writer or, or gets in the way of your work as a writer? Uh, what do you like about being a writer in New Orleans? What do you not like? Uh, and that's enough to start with, I think. Would you repeat what you said before the question? Uh, <laughs> These are some fantastic writers. Uh. <laughs> I grew up here, went off, came back, went off, came back. I have a mortgage, my children are getting older and I'm here and I went through a torturous experience as everyone I'm sure from the city did during the hurricane. And I suppose it's that traumatic experience rather got me to focus and define why this rather absurd piece of geography means so much to me. You know, we're stuck at the bottom of America, sort of appendage to the continent more than really a, a part of it. And with my interest in politics, I've always been entertained by the extravagant impulses of what, for a better term, we call democracy. Um, and uh, I, I, I came back because I, I had to. I had a house. Uh, and I will tell you that if that house had flooded um, to the degree that other people took such terrible losses, I probably wouldn't be here. I'd have a job somewhere else, God forbid, being a, just a journalist. But um, I think what is happening now is that all of us who are from here or of here, regardless of where one you know, was born, I think we're all struggling and wrestling with an, an, a changing um, identity of the city. The old moniker, the Big Easy, to me seems almost profane now, and I hope I don't sound too much like a moralist or, or too deadpan a product of Jesuit High School, Ralph, but um, I think everyone who is serious about what's going on here has to struggle much more so than in the past to deal with the heavy weight of sorrow and the losses and the burdens that people carry without ignoring 
that uh, grand sense of comedy that is so much a part of the literary landscape and the society and the cultural reality of these latitudes. Um, I <laughs> Just one little advertisement, and then I'll move on. I'll let them take over. But uh, there's a scene in my novel, Last of the Red Hot Papas, where um, um, uh, one legislator is, these group of guys are scheming. Uh, the governor has died in a compromising position. This is a group projection on my part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> parenthetically, nude lipstick on his legs top floor of the mansion. Um, that's how it begins. And so the, these guys in the legislature come together and they've got to get rid of the lieutenant governor who is reported to be, quote, an alcoholic without parallel among his peers. And so they're involved in this whole machination about how do we get around you know, that, that bump in the road, namely the constitution of the state. And, and one guy says to the other, look, I agree with all you want to do. I'm just powerful concerned about the legality of it. Thanks. And uh, <laughs> I, I was, I went on a tour this fall to foreign countries like Boston and Chicago and places <laughs> like that. And I was giving a reading um, at Notre Dame uh, in South Bend and a young lady came up to me afterwards and said, a uh, student in the creative writing program, and she said, I'm just uh, amazed that you could make up a statement like I'm powerful concerned about the legality of it. <laughs> you know, this is one of those moments where you sort of want to say, well, I mean, imagination comes easily to me, my dear. The truth, which I didn't reveal then, but will in full disclosure now. I was following a piece of environmental legislation in 1980. Ben Baggert, who was then a state senator, had this bill that would revoke the tax-exempt status of industries found guilty of violating pollution laws. It seemed like a pretty pragmatic thing in one of the most polluted states in the country. That bill was tortured and dismembered in committee, never even got out in one piece. And I was walking across, God is my witness, I was walking across the rotunda after the after the act of democracy itself, blood yet on the floor. And uh, I hear this one, and these two old boys who were on the committee, I won't say names, but anyway, they're in the book in different names, but anyway, they're walking along, and, and they're talking about something completely different. They've just gutted this bill, and he says, look, I agree with all you want to do. I'm just powerful concerned about the legality of it. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> it only took 20 years to use it. I yield to Chris. <laughs> I love the way things come back when you're, you know, in that in that state of your writing and um, your your mind just starts going everywhere and free associating, and you come up with these things from a long time ago. Um, maybe was it Walker Percy who said um, everything that happens to you as a writer is in the first six years, and after that, nothing really matters. This proves that it does. <laughs> You have to be there to overhear these wonderful things. Um, listening to Jason's talking about coming, leaving, coming back, leaving, coming back, I guess all of us have maybe tried to leave. I've tried to leave this city any number of times in my life and then find myself someplace like the Hollywood Hills of Los Angeles, waking up one morning and thinking, I've got to go home now packing the Volkswagen bug, and within two hours, out of there and on the road. Stuff like that just had to come home. Um, and I guess in that, that particular instance, I, didn't, I wasn't trying to write professionally at that time and didn't even, it, it, was, it hadn't crossed my mind that that was something I should do. I was still trying to get jobs and the advertising industry was one of them. Um, you know, the wardrobe assistant for the uh, rock and roll band. Um, I don't know, there were many, many jobs. <laughs> like all writers, I think we have many jobs. But now, I love Jason bringing up the, uh, the Big Easy. I have decided we are no longer the Big Easy. We are now the Big Delay. <laughs> so that that's, describes us to a T. Um, I think that writing here has always been 
pretty much of a pleasure for me. It's been, I've always felt extremely lucky to be from this town. Um, I, I, I will even admit to being smug over it. <laughs> smug comes back to bite you on the ass. Because things are tough right now and every writer I'm talking to is telling me about how much trouble they're having writing now since Katrina. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed blessing for sure because at one and the same time it seems like there's a tremendous opportunity here to write about this. Then when you actually start to do it, you're caught between this desire to, or this, I'm, I should speak for myself, except I've talked to so many writers that I don't think I'm speaking just out of a, the abyss or anything, or, or we're all in the abyss together. But, you know, at one and the same time you feel like, oh, I've got this tremendous opportunity, and then you go to write it and you're caught between uh, wanting to do justice by it and show everybody not from here the rest of the country who at times seem so just uh, indifferent to what's going on here not all not always but you know people are forgetting now let's face it and it feels up to the writers especially the fiction writers because the nonfiction writers have have thank goodness been right out there with everything but now we need to tell the story in a different way and I feel really caught between this desire to tell it in all of its grim realism and at the same time thinking that by the time this book would get out into the public, nobody's going to want to hear that anymore. We've heard the grim realism over and over. So then I go back to what Jason was referring to, our, our ability here to laugh, to laugh at ourselves, to um, just in general take things with a bit more ease than maybe a lot of people do. And then I want to make everything really funny. And that's not a good state to be in when you're writing. Just to clarify, <laughs> <laughs> the way Marsha and I spent the Saturday night before the hurricane hit uh, was driving around the city because we realized we had nothing but white wine left. And if we lost power on Monday morning, we weren't going to drink warm white wine. So we spent uh, very late into Saturday night finding a case of red wine uh, in case we did lose power on Monday. If um, you'd waited for Monday, you could have just gotten it for free. For free. Yeah. <laughs> but by the next like the morning, my friends, yeah. <laughs> by the next morning, it became clear that we weren't going to be drinking red wine in New Orleans, and so we set out with a million other people uh, to flee the city. Uh, and eventually wound up in a 3,500-mile odyssey that we took in her little VW Beetle uh, with two cats in the back seat that my son brought along. I'm totally allergic to cats. So I did the entire 3,500 miles wearing a mask, um, which almost got me killed in northern Texas at midnight on the first day of driving. I, I walked into a convenience store having forgotten that I'd been wearing this mask for 18 hours, and two Texans with shotguns come running at me from either side. So I think, oh my God, they're being robbed. And I turn around, get out the door, and I see my reflection wearing a mask. So I start screaming, no, no, it's for the cats. It's for the cats. <laughs> that turned out to be the most dangerous moment of um, the flood of New Orleans for me. When we finally found some shelter uh, just outside of New York in my daughter's house, uh, there was a debate raging in the United States about whether we should be classified uh, evacuees or refugees. Uh, even Congress spoke to the matter. Um, the Democrats argued that we were evacuees. And I wound up writing an essay uh, contemplating what had happened to us in the last 10 days or so since we had fled the city uh, and realized that I don't feel like an evacuee or a refugee, I feel like I'm in exile uh, and wrote an essay about that. Uh, you know, I noted that everywhere we went, Americans couldn't have been more generous to us. Um, they fed us, they, they gave us clothes, we had nothing. Um, they, they just couldn't have been kinder to us. But everywhere we went, every gesture of that hospitality uh, seemed to reinforce the notion that um, I was traveling in a foreign country. The accent was different, the music was different, the coffee was much, much weaker. Uh, and the Times saw that essay and asked me uh, to start writing for them, uh, but said, you're going to have to go right back to New Orleans. And so as soon as we could get past the roadblocks, uh, we came back here and slept in a daycare center for three weeks on the floor, just cold water. Uh, I'm two inches taller now because 
we gutted our house every day in that 100 degree weather and then went home and took ice cold showers. And so I'm still much straighter in my posture than I used to be. <laughs> in writing about um, you know, kicking in my front door and seeing what was left of our house and then about the, the much greater suffering that many other New Orleanians face. Uh, for the, really the first time, I started writing about New Orleans. Uh, and as I look back over my fiction, it began to be obvious to me that I had avoided New Orleans as a setting. Um, Ralph said that I published a collection of stories called The Torturer's Apprentice. There are 14 stories in there and only one is set in New Orleans. And it's about a boy who can turn himself into different kinds of animals and he uses that to woo an indifferent girl. Uh, that seemed to make sense here. In fact, it, I published it in a literary magazine. The editor wrote back and said, you know, I used to live next door to that guy in the quarter when I... <laughs> <laughs> And when it came time to write my novel, Oyster, I set it in Plaquemines Parish rather than here. And I think the reason I avoided New Orleans is that everyone in the world believes that New Orleans belongs to them. Um, in fact, um, in all my columns for the Times uh, were being published on the internet as well, and so I got responses from all over the world. And someone from Tokyo wrote, um, don't those Americans understand that New Orleans doesn't belong to the United States? It belongs to the world. Uh, <laughs> But from a writer's point of view, that means that reader brings, um, every reader brings a personal conception of the city, its culture, its climate. Uh, and so it's very difficult, in a short story at least, to correct those misunderstandings and to posit a real New Orleans. So I had never really written about the city before. Um, but as Chris and um, Jason and, and Ralph have pointed out, um, the flood changed everything. Uh, and it became obvious that all of us had to put aside our poetry and our plays and our novels and get busy telling the story to America and the world about the circumstances in which we found ourselves. But as Chris was saying just now as well, um, we had to go back eventually to the forms that we understood best. Uh, and about a year ago I started working on Rising Water, a play which as well said is now up at Southern Rep. Uh, and just as he summarized, it's about a couple who's awakened in the middle of the night to find their living room, um, their, their bedroom rather, flooding. Uh, it was based upon the columns I had written, and uh, when I tried to look into how it was possible that 1,500 Americans drowned in the city or died of heat exhaustion or dehydration on their rooftops of the, that week while we waited for the United States to show up. Um, and as I, I got more deeply into the play, uh, it began to attract attention and was performed three months ago in New York at the uh, National Showcase of New American Plays. And the response there was, they really liked it, and this was only theater professionals who were allowed to attend this, and said, but it's just like Samuel Beckett. It's like waiting to get out these people on the rooftop surrounded by water without hope. It's so existentialist. And they urged me to push it further in that direction. Um, but on the flight from New York back to New Orleans, I decided to do just the opposite. And for the first time in my writing career, to write something just for New Orleans. Um, and I think all of us now uh, are beginning in a very, very different way uh, to address our home. Can I just say, too, that, yeah, eloquently put, and John's play um, does something that uh, I think is, is really quite wonderful, which is to show the grim reality of it. And at the same time, there's a quite, quite wonderful strain of humor that goes through it. And um, I, I envy that when I watch it, because that feels like what we all need to do. We need to show the grim reality, but also the resilience of people. And how better to show that than through their ability to finally laugh. Job well done. Well, it's because New Orleanians are tough. Um, you know, my family's been here for over 200 years, and the people who came here at this godforsaken place um, I, I teach at a, a Jesuit university. When the Jesuits first came here, they would have going to set up what would have been the first university in North America. They looked around and said, human beings can't possibly survive here. And they went down to Grand Coteau instead and opened a school. Um, and I, I think New Orleans are the descendants of very, very tough people. Um, and we're used to laughing at disaster because uh, disaster is always approaching. Um, what, what about, um, I, I don't know if this steers us away from Katrina or not, uh, but it seems to me, in, in thinking about this, this idea of New Orleans as a home for writers uh, over the last few weeks especially, but really over the last couple of decades as I've you know, lived in New Orleans as a home for you know, this writer, not always a particularly hospitable one. Um, I, I think about all the really wonderful writers who aren't here, who uh, said, well, you know, so long, I'll, I'll be doing my work about New Orleans from, I don't know, North Carolina or San Francisco or New York or 
Boston. And I, I think a lot of that is, is for, uh, or let me, let me ask it in a way, not just assert it, that for economic opportunity that there, there may be, uh, unless you can survive merely as a writer or happen to be, you know, blessed with uh, secret money from some source that, uh, you know, uh, that, that surviving as a writer here is uh, maybe conspicuously difficult because there's not that much money here, uh, at least not, not if you don't already have it, or uh, I don't know if I'm saying this right, or if you're not connected to the tourist industry. Uh, and there's a kind of ancillary thought there, which is that uh, um, one of the things that Katrina showed us uh, is how impoverished a city this is economically, and how many genuinely poor people live here. I mean, people who are poorer than you can imagine being really almost um, I can imagine being pretty poor, and I can't even quite imagine uh, some of what I saw, what, what it must be like on a day-to-day -day basis to try to take care of your kids when you got nothing. And, well, that's enough. I mean, right there you sort of stopped, aren't you? Uh, both of my kids were born in the 21st century, oddly enough, and uh, that's a, a funny thing to say, I just thought I'd say it there. Uh, whereas their children are 20th century children. And one of the other things that, by the way, we all have in common is we all have children. I'm not sure how many writers I don't know, do most writers have children? That's, a, that's another question, but... Um, <laughs> only the good ones. Only the good ones. <laughs> only the lucky ones, maybe. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the realities in a, in a place that's economically deprived is that there tends to be, uh, although actually I guess if you look at Cuba, uh, this is a contradiction because Cuba is economically deprived but has 100% literacy. We are economically deprived, and I would guess that there's a good 30% illiteracy rate in this city right now. Uh, and always has been, and when I say 30% illiteracy, I mean people who can't really functionally uh, deal with the written word. Um, and what does that do <laughs> to New Orleans as a home for writers? I mean, is it a is it a paradox? Is it an irony? Is it uh, New Orleans? Even for me, as a as a person who lives here and has experienced the uh, aftermath of Katrina, uh, still Katrina is kind of uh, pictures for me. Uh, uh, video pictures, uh, film on television from our various sites in exile, uh, and still photographs. And it's really hard for me as a writer to get past the pictures. Those really, those are such full stories in a way. And I wonder if that might not be part of what is blocking um, writers from dealing with this. Okay, there. <laughs> I want to say something about unwrite, uh, unblocking writer's block. I have great admiration for my colleagues. Um, the only problem I have is that there are not enough hours in the day to work. Um, and yes, those pictures are on my mind. They're on everyone's minds. The, the horrific damage that was done to human beings in the Superdome and the Convention Center and Lakeview and elsewhere, that's all part of the mental topography that is within everyone in this room. We all carry it. That said, I. I I think we have a responsibility not to be a victim city uh, and not to be a community of victimized writers who are dwelling solely on the damage. There's been terrible damage. No one would begin to deny it. But I think what, I think what people expect of literature, uh, and I would include nonfiction work and certainly dramatic works in this as well, and I will get to the play but haven't yet. My wife took her class to see it at Loyola, but, um, you know, people expect the, the balance between tragedy and hope, and I think what we're all probably wrestling with, and maybe I'm taking a footnote from Chris on this, but I think we're all wrestling with, with how to strike that balance, how to maintain the respect that we have to give for those, particularly those people who have died. Uh, or suffered such catastrophic losses that they're no longer here and are trying to get back. Um, but I think that, you know, I don't know when the great Katrina novel will be written. I suspect it's going to take some time, though, because to follow a family or a group of individuals over that, over that span of time, we're still in a period when, you know, the pain is pretty fresh. But I, I think what... Uh, you know, this, this is one of the most exciting times imaginable to be in this city. 
I, I was talking before about how difficult I found New Orleans as a setting for stories. But another problem now faces all of us, and that is, what is the form uh, in which we can tell the story of what's happened to us? Um, there are thousands of stories from those days and since that need to be told. But the dilemma for us is that something like this has never happened to America before. Um, the Europeans understand much more immediately our predicament. Um, people in France compared New Orleans to Chernobyl, uh, since it's the only city they had that recently had been evacuated by the military and has only partially returned to functioning. Um, a German reader uh, told me it was, it's like Dresden. Um, in fact, I, I was, I've been traveling a lot reading stories and I always read something about New Orleans at the end and a German immigrant in Los, in Los Angeles raised his head at the, hand at the end and he said, you know, um, the way you've described New Orleans, it, it sounds like Germany when I was a child after the war. He said, but you should take hope. Look at how we rose from the ashes. And I said, yes, it's true, we're, we're very much like Germany, except you had the United States to help you rebuild. <laughs> good job, good job. Yeah. <laughs> but to be fair to the Americans, I think one reason they're having such a hard time understanding us is that we don't have a story for comprehending what's happened to this city. They continue to think that this was a hurricane. And all of us in the United States know the hurricane story. Uh, the first day, it's the idiot reporter leaning into the wind, saying, yes, the wind's blowing here. <laughs> the next day, it's a husband, wife, and child on the slab, all that's left of their house, weeping, saying, well, at least we have our lives. And the third day, they're sweeping up. Right? That's not what happened in New Orleans. It wasn't a natural disaster. It was a man-made catastrophe. Uh, and we just don't have a structure to tell that story yet. So I think everybody is right. There are going to be many works of literature coming out of this. But the real struggle for us will be to find forms which are appropriate for this unique story. I would just like to make a brief uh, remark uh, in response. Uh, the reason most Americans do not understand the dynamics of the flood is because of the absolutely abysmal response by our own elected officials. Mm -hmm. uh, Nagin was a clown on the in national and international stage, and Kathleen Blanco, God bless her, I think she's tried, but uh, she was not able to make the case. And if you look at the first big bill that went into Congress after the hurricane, Mary Landrew and David Vitter, our senators, asked for $250 billion. It was one of the biggest pork barrel efforts imaginable and I think those those responses had a, a a terrible impact on what is now being called the look let's not go into George W. Bush we all have opinions and they're all right um, <laughs> no they're all left <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I stand on the principled center but uh, no uh, you know I think, in a sense, we, we, we used to laugh at our politics. And the, the novel I wrote was finished before Katrina. There is a flood in the end, and it's set in 1993. It's set in Baton Rouge, and there's a symbolic reason for that flood. Yeah. Um, but I, I think we have to be realistic about how badly uh, the politics that used to entertain us in the end uh, has yeah. failed us. And so, obviously, our, our responsibilities as, uh, as writers, I don't think, is to you know, go out and run for office or anything like that. But why somehow, not? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, why not? Well, not me. I could never raise the money. But um, <laughs> I have trouble raising money enough as it is. Uh, but uh, no, I, I think we, we have to bear that in mind that somehow we've, we've got to keep a focus, uh, even though we tend to be literary folk on the, on the political realities. So. And, and let imagine, imagination come into play. I think it's quite wonderful to have a flood in Baton Rouge at the end of your novel. <laughs> <laughs> Can we have another one there? <laughs> the, uh, I, I've made uh, three notes on, on this pad while my, my friends were talking. One was uh, you just addressed politics as comedy in New Orleans. I have an exclamation point, question mark after it, and C. Ray Nagin under it. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I have not been inclined to, to join the, the flood of uh, sort of dump, dumping on the mayor, not that he doesn't deserve it. Um, 
I see him more as a kind of hapless Republican uh, corporate executive of a monopoly who uh, wandered into the mayor's office and somebody said, hey, you be mayor because nothing's going on anyway. So in a way you could say, hey, it's not my fault if you're Ray Nagin, but I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not entirely serious. Go ahead. I just, to he's a character in search of his script. Yeah, exactly right. And you know, the, the, the funny thing about, about Nagin is he seems to know it. I mean, I, I can imagine one of the great New Orleans post-Katrina novels will feature Ray Nagin as a character called Ray Nagin, uh, just going through his normal days. Um, I also wrote uh, down that you, Chris, were, were once uh, felt smug over being from New Orleans. I felt that way too once in the 70s, briefly. Uh, I even wrote a poem about it, how we didn't really want everybody to know about us because we, you know, we had such a nice thing going on here. Not really true. Um, it seems to me this is a place of little opportunity and, uh, you know, I, I, I think, uh, again, I'm, I'm going back to the question I asked before that maybe it's my own experience of being a writer in New Orleans and not, uh, and not any, anybody else's in, on the panel, but it seems to me a difficult place to write from, just strategically. Um, and I think that, that is one reason why a lot of people have chosen not to make it their home, who are writers who are from New Orleans. Um, but I may be wrong about that. And the other thing, and maybe this is the one that I want to ask about, Jason said, uh, where we are is where we were meant to be which, uh, you know, is a kind of stirring thing to say and to hear, uh, but it, it, to me it, it exists in, in the realm of, uh, of faith, of, uh, of something, you know, of, of sensing that there are larger, uh, I guess I want to ask about that as, as part of New Orleans, since New Orleans is such a sort of a city of, uh, however peculiar, of faith, of religion, of uh, uh, people who are, uh, you know, God-obsessed and God-haunted and, uh, uh, you know, a church on every corner that a bar isn't on, you know, that whole thing. Um, what about that? Is that, I mean, do you have to be a person of faith to say what Jason said? Uh, we are where we were meant to be? Are we just, uh, you know, the victims of an accident? I know we don't want to be called victims, uh, but are we accidentally here? John, you seem like you want to... You know, I think this is a place where we now choose to be, uh, not where we were meant to be. Um, too many people have come back and tried it, uh, and in the face of the utter lack of political leadership at every level, um, are giving up now um, and moving. Um, I know eight couples who are leaving in the next two years who came back and tried. Uh, you know, it's just a very, very difficult place to live. It's an extremely difficult place to make a living. Um, but if you love it, I mean, you have to stay as long as you can manage. Um, and I think that's why most people who are in New Orleans right now are here. They've chosen it, hard as it is. May I just put, interject something extraordinarily positive into this whole thing? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, no, it's not. It, it, you know, there's plenty to be negative about. And first of all, I've always thought that this was a fabulous place full of opportunity to write. That's why I always thought I was so lucky to be from here because I, it was real easy for me to write about New Orleans for years and years and years. Um, the local color was just to die for. Now the local color has changed, and I think that's what we're grappling with. But on the positive side, yes, a lot of people are leaving. But what has astounded me is the young people who have come back or stayed who are so dedicated to the city, so in love with it, in love with it in that way that I, I remember being in love with it. Mm -hmm. I own it, it's mine. I walk the streets of the, of the French Quarter, I'm just possessed with this feeling of ownership. And they believe that and they are doing everything they know how to do in the face of, um, Yes, it's difficult to make a living, and yet they're managing not just to make a living, but to do it in an entrepreneurial way that I find really exciting, really exciting. And these are all 20 and 30-something year olds. My daughter is one of them. She has started a website that concentrates on New Orleans businesses, artists, products from here. She got married a couple of weeks ago. I thought that this was a girl who would have a destination wedding. Yeah, but she did. <laughs> Rosie's Jazz Hall. She decided any money that was spent on her wedding was going to be spent in the city of New Orleans. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's really an excellent point. One of the things that's, 
I think distressed all of us over you know our lifetimes is seeing so many people leave, and you know it's even been called the brain drain. You know that the IQ of norm sort of drops uh, every decade by a few points. And there's something to that, uh, and I, I absolutely agree. I mean, one of the things that's just uh, almost unbelievable about this is the response of uh, of people in their 20s, I guess mostly, and maybe in their 30s, young people. Uh, to New Orleans, and, and in fact, you know, one of the, the, the great realities of Katrina may turn out to be that it brought young people in and revitalized the city in a way that we could never have done without a, a catastrophe. So that's, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, I think that's got a lot to do with what's happening in the city right now and why those of us who are staying are staying. Uh, when I, I, I wrote 10 drafts of my play, Rising Water, about this couple of Captain Erratic. The first five were so furious, uh, and, uh, it could not possibly have been performed. And it took me that long to get myself and my opinions off the stage and to leave room for this couple, um, Sugar and Camille, who've been together over 30 years. And I began to realize that we can't go on talking about what happened here in terms of its particulars. That's for nonfiction. There, we've got to begin, as we must as writers, to look for metaphors. And it seemed to me that any couple that's been together a long time uh, have got to find a way when they realize the water's coming up the stairs uh, to go on loving each other. And so um, the theater insisted on putting under the title of my play, Rising Water, a New Orleans love story. And I think in the end, that's really what it is and what's really holding all of us together. Uh, we love the place and we love each other. Wow. Yeah. On that note, we're being given the signal that we're we're done here. So um, I want to thank. Ask uh, another question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> may, may we go now, uh, John, uh, Jason? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Y'all are a terrific audience.